is that about three quarters of a million uh, North Carolinians do not have access. Hold up a second. I don't have access. I know what you're going to say. To um, broadband, ninety percent of those rural areas. Um, yes, I think the numbers are low. Yes, I think it's dramatically higher than that because uh, this is self-reported data from the providers themselves. Yes, sir. Yeah. My my question was, what's the definition of broadband? That you're yeah. So broadband, we set at the FCC threshold currently. Uh, the order that they issued in February of 2015, which is 25 down, right? 25 right down, and uh, three up. So what we did was, taking uh, taking that challenge, we actually issued uh, and sent out a, some of you might have received this, a survey to 3,500 uh, local leaders across the state, asked for their specific challenges regarding broadband. This was a survey. We received those back, and we, um, and using those challenges, we uh, interviewed uh, almost 60 experts in the area of uh, various areas, I should say, healthcare, education, um, workforce development, and so forth. Um, and uh, we held a number of listening sessions, almost uh, over a dozen listening sessions, and put together a state broadband plan. You can find it at this website here. It's online. I also have hard copies that I can get to you. Um, and we can put them out to you. Um, but everything's online there, and it's a good resource. And what we did, we came up with almost 80 recommendations from the different groups that we interviewed on ways that the state government leaders, whether they're in the executive branch or at the General Assembly or at the community uh, local level, can improve uh, broadband uh, access and adoption in their communities. We, um, through, the, through these interviews, um, and we, we found a common theme from, from most of the folks, and I think it was, it was captured, that theme was captured best by a guy named Larry Levin, who some of you may know, former uh, chief of staff for uh, the FCC and was executive director for the National Broadband Plan when, they, when the FCC drafted that in 2010. And what he said was it's not about wealth or density, which is something that we always look at, or I, I should say we always look at where when we're looking at where providers are going. Oh, that's where the rich people live, but that's where you have population density. But Larry said, you know what, actually we're seeing the communities that plan um, are actually those communities that are bridging the digital divide. And I'll show you more about that in a minute. Give you some examples. So um, we uh, so through the plan we thought well, we'll do we'll do several things. We'll focus on accomplishing several things. Closing the homework gap, for example. Homework gap is defined as those students at home uh, who do not have access at home but are required to do digital homework. They have a device at school. Uh, they're in a one-on-one -on -one program. The teacher assigns homework. They have to take that back home. They don't. They can't hook the internet to do to, to do the, uh, the, um, the homework. Uh, so that we found was the most significant challenge that local leaders uh, conveyed to us through the survey. Uh, right now, we are partnering with, does everybody know what the Friday Institute is? <coughs> Friday Institute. Friday Institute. Okay, Friday Institute is a, housed at North Carolina State University. They're an education think tank. They do a lot of policy around education. They wrote the state's digital learning plan. They do education outreach for professional development for teachers. We're uh, currently, uh, we, we partnered with them on, on several projects in the past, and right now we're looking at trying to really capture the real data, the numbers behind the homework gap in North Carolina. So it may cost a little money, and we may have to do some surveys, but right now we're putting together a plan to do just that. Um, and then, of course, the plan looks kind of to the future. What, what are we looking at, and, and how does the state position themselves for five years? I'm sure all of you uh, read some of the same uh, stuff that we read. Uh, and it seems that every, everybody is going to fiber and everybody's going to wireless 5G. There's a lot of talk about some different technologies, uh, wireless technologies out there that will be in the future. Um, and so we want to make sure that the state is positioned well for uh, whatever happens for the future and to be as adaptable as possible. Um, we are uh, provider agnostic and we are ecumenical when it comes to the technologies. But I think we all understand and every, anyone in the industry Regardless of how they hook up the, their last mile, how they whatever whatever device they use or the infrastructure they use to run the last mile, they all have a fiber backbone uh, and, and to run the back. Also, uh, you know, we really think that's where, where we're going, and that's what the state needs to make sure that it's either putting money towards its investments or encouraging providers to, to 
Um, some of the things that we want to do, though, getting back to the numbers issue, is we need, we need better data, though. Mapping data that was collected over the five years that the NC Broadband Initiative collected it was good. It was what the providers would allow uh, themselves to, to give to the state and to the FCC and TIA. Uh, but unfortunately, it's, it's a little efficient. Mark and I actually grew up together. We were kind of talking about that. Actually, I think he even bent his ear and I was, I was, uh, I was complaining, for lack of a better word, um, about uh, some of the things that we're, that we're finding in the maps that aren't accurate. We want to build, and we built part of this as a diagnostic tool for communities. So, for example, when we go into a community that says, hey, we need help with our broadband uh, access or connectivity, we want to be able to say, okay, well, what, what, what is the real problem here? Um, right now, uh, according to provider data, North Carolina um, has over 90% access rate and 25 megs down, but only a 16% adoption rate. One of the lowest adopted states, we just don't have the folks subscribing with that higher, higher threshold. So, um, so one of the things we want to do is Look at not only that and the access and what the uh, infrastructure is out there, but also how many providers are in a particular area. It's a big driver for innovation and affordability. If you only have one provider, uh, we're finding less of a likelihood that they're going to upgrade their infrastructure of the network to next gen, less uh, of a chance that they're going to uh, have a, um, you know, a lower price. I was uh, just before I came here this morning, I was looking around, poking around online at a few places and a few providers. And it was kind of interesting to see the different prices across the, um, the state for some different providers. And I noticed that you know those areas where you have one, and they may have a good service, but for example, uh, I noticed out where my in-laws live in Hendersonville, they would pay um, they would pay I think over hundred dollars for maybe fifty megs an hour, and um, something like that, and, and uh, paying fifty-five to forty-five an hour as well. So big big disparities where you don't have competition. Wendell is like that too. We have an area, we have a road or two that, that they won't even come down the road because there's only one or two people. So those people don't even get in on that. And we don't have a second provider that's in town. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So how do we um, how do we help with that? One of the ways is we're trying to create and pull together, make sure we're creating we're pulling together all the state resources. So for example, working with the Department of Transportation, working with the Department of Environmental Quality, cataloging all of the road projects or water sewer projects across the state that we know of so that we, we can keep the providers informed about when a ditch is being done. So in your situation, if, if they're doing a road widening project or they're doing something out there where they're digging a ditch or someone's going to need access to poles uh, a little easier, let them know that so that it might be a, a cost uh, that the state bears because they're the ones Digging the ditch. Are you guys doing like a dig once policy, or are you? Doing we we yeah. recommended the dig once policy in our plan. You'll see it's one of the first recommendations I think okay. in our plan. Um, uh, as you have probably seen around the country, those localities that are promoting dig once have run into a little bit of legal trouble here and there. Um, the federal government has a dig once policy. DOT has one that they promote. Uh, the Federal Highway Administration has policy papers out on it, which I've happily uh, happily. Um, Relayed to our DOT that was aware of them, and um, and so you know there's a lot of state and federal government tension at times. Um, so one of the things that we've tried to do is be an educator in that regard with our federal, with our our colleague agencies. Uh, but what we'd like to see is when we've had um, recent success in this in Asheville, um, you know DOT is divided up into regions, and, and so some of those district engineers kind of are the the king of the castle. They're, you know, they, they don't uh, have much regard for what's coming out of Raleigh sometimes. Um, and uh, but in our case, in Ashland, we were able to engage with DOT up there. And um, uh, I'm not sure if you're, you all know Hunter Guzman in the ERC, but he wanted to run under the Parkway, the Blue Ridge Parkway over there, uh, where they were doing a sidewalk project. Uh, if you all know anything about building networks, that's incredibly difficult. It took years just for our DOT to get uh, permits and, and everything to go under the parkway. Uh, but uh, with that open, with that trench open, with the boring under there, um, we were able to work out between the city and DOT for, for uh, 100 companies. And at his own expense, 
uh, and, and, and below this conduit, below this fiber through there. So that was a, that was a good news. A small, but it was a, but it was a first step. Uh, the next one is Haven Farm, where uh, you'll see later I'll use it as an example. They were doing a huge water sewer project, um, and they just put out a notice in their local press. We promoted it also on our social media and through some of our um, uh, newsletters. Uh, to, to the providers, hey, we're digging the ditch, jump in. Um, so, uh, the other thing that we're doing is looking for funding for, for folks. Uh, so, we hired uh, someone out of the Department of Commerce, our North Carolina Department of Commerce, who has a decade of experience in um, economic development in rural areas. And we've had a couple of um, successes recently in the General Assembly course, uh, the obligated. $1.25 million of community development block grant funds, which usually goes towards water school or housing or something like that, for specifically for broadband. So we think we found a couple of neat um, areas where we could use that money uh, to benefit the communities. It's very difficult because this hasn't been done before. It hasn't been done before in anywhere in the U.S. except in Virginia, uh, and there were very specific types of projects. So uh, we've talked to the state of Virginia. Numerous phone calls with Washington and uh, Housing and Urban Development, which uh, runs the community development block grant program. They're very excited about some of the things we're talking about doing. Um, and uh, I think everyone is excited at the state level, but you know, you have the technocrats who are like, no, the rules are this, you can't do this. And so, yeah, but Washington says it. So it goes on and on. But if we can break through uh, that wall, that will be a new source that we're going to use in the future. Appalachian Region Commission. Just to partner with them to award 10 small communities uh, money for uh, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi uh, in their downtowns, so that they can promote that. Um, and uh, that was good. Did you find small? I think I think we tried to keep it to like around 5,000 people. 75. I think the, the biggest one was 7,500. The smallest one was, was uh, I think was under a thousand. Uh, so, the other thing we want to make sure we're doing it is that we're, uh, we're educating folks and, um, and working with some of our, our other agencies, ARC and some other folks, trying to get the good news stories out with partnerships. We don't have any money, we don't have any regulatory authority, so it's just charm and friendships. So, I'd like people to have votes, you know, you want a friend with a vote? We don't have grants, so we make fast friends with those people that do have a lot of money. Um, so, uh, getting back to our technical assistance team, this may be most useful for you all. Uh, again, it's on our website, site, ncbroadband.gov. We have three gentlemen who have decades and decades of experience building out networks. Um, Keith coming over in the west, Glenn Knox in the central part of the state, and then George Collier in the eastern part of the state. And they are a local community resource. Uh, Keith lives in Asheville, Glenn lives in Stokes County, and George lives in Raleigh. And uh, they take they each have around 31 counties, and uh, they work directly with the folks in those counties. Uh, most recently, Bell Carnet, and uh, sat down and talked about some of the issues that they're going through. And it's a it, it's a free resource. It's, it's voluntary. It's it's a, it's a um, partnership of the willing. So we're happy to, to work with folks on other particular issues. Um, one of the things that the team does is. They have a process or a plan for actually getting better access or expanding access to the communities. Uh, and uh, it starts with setting goals and forming broadband task forces and those sorts of things. The end goal of the objective of all this planning is to get to the table with the providers, either the public providers or new providers, gathering all this information, demand aggregation on your systems, uh, uh, pricing information, infrastructure information, vetting your vertical towers or your vertical assets in the counties, looking at where all the infrastructure currently lays, what they may be able to use, and sitting down across the table for them, inviting them to a meeting, and then talking through uh, how they could benefit if the community were to uh, allow them access to, uh, to the infrastructure or to vertical assets and so forth. Uh, a lot of providers, as you probably know, don't do demand aggregation. They'll just look at a map or they'll look at a, at a city or population and say, how many people per mile can I get? Or how many hookups per mile can I get in this particular area? And in some cases, we've had where the providers have come to weave 
assembled a lot of data, they go, oh, okay, we didn't realize that there was this much demand. So one of the certain things that we do is put in our, our plan. Success stories, Yancey and Mitchell counties, fiber the home uh, through country cable vision, a small regional provider. Um, and uh, they used uh, some Recovery Act money uh, when that was available, and they matched it with some of their own money. Uh, the country cable vision put up some money, and they built fiber the home for, for all their residents. Uh, this is, uh, it was incredibly successful. Country Cable Vision put some uh, head ends on the uh, board of Avery and Haywood and Madison, and now they're looking at those other counties to try to expand. So that's a, that's a good thing. It, it was so popular, there was so much demand there. Uh, they look to expand to other counties. We're trying to do that by money. Haywood, I mentioned, is that the Broadway Planning Task Force. They're moving forward. Uh, they did the demand aggregation, and, and as I mentioned, they notified the ISPs that they're super big. So. Uh, another trying to be proactive, so trying to work for what we need to do. Um, Avery County, same thing. We, we worked, uh, we did some demand aggregation, used some of our own resources to plot uh, where the folks uh, were on the map, uh, help them create a map, help them with uh, a little bit to encourage the USDA, our US uh, grant application for a million dollars. And now we have not only Country Cable Vision interested in running fiber to the home, but we also have uh, OS that's interested in doing some, um, uh, some wireless, uh, fixed wireless in remote parts of the area. So it's also a team, so we're actually yeah. department of the county. Yeah. And of course, Holly Springs, they're in the back there. You can talk to them about yeah. their. Uh, I didn't expect this to get slotted. <laughs> What's that? I said, I expect this to get slotted. Well, I think this is a great news story and something that hasn't been done. Uh, it's pretty unique around the country, frankly. And um, and uh, I'm sure Jeff will be willing to talk to you. I won't steal his thunder, but um, just the way they went about it, I, I had a chance to go down and meet Jeff and hear his story. It's uh, very, very methodical, very planned, business plan. I got some, uh, some help, um, but they were also very forward leaning and, and looking at their infrastructure, how they own it, and then how they can use it easy. So good news story there. The other one is that's the engine that we have heard of where folks in the triangle area kind of got together again. They assembled their resources and were very proactive about the issue of RFP and going after a provider at AT&T came back and came back with a plan to, to expand their fiber access uh, across the, the state. So um, that's, it. Yeah, that's our contact information. So feel free to reach out to us, ncbroadband.gov again. Uh, we do have a, a, a monthly email list, uh, I mean a newsletter, I'm sorry, that we put out, 5,000 folks on it. Feel free to add your name if you go to our website and sign up for it. We usually try to put out one or two stories, success stories, and then some helpful hints. We just put out a mailer on who to have on your, on your Broadway play uh, task force team. Uh, so good tips and information for you, uh, we hope, and, uh, and, a, and a good resource too hear what other folks are doing. We just came out with a number of videos. They're not working for me today, but we are uh, pointing out uh, some video vignettes to show uh, folks uh, what's, uh, what's some of the good news uh, <coughs> other, that other folks in the, in the uh, state are doing, like Wi-Fi and school buses, for example. Montgomery County did that. So we tell their story in the video that has some copy. Uh, to tell you how to do that. We'll come out with one soon. Um, uh, a, a profile on a company called Advanced Super, Advanced Super Abrasives, Mars Hill. They make these uh, grinding wheels for the, the, uh, the, everything from like helping to sharpen knives or make knives to, to other uses of big machines. A lot of work in Asia. Um, we used a grant that's no longer in existence. We're trying to try to revive it. It's called Disconnect. It was available for small companies that needed a connection of, from um, from the street to their facility. So we were able to get uh, about fifteen thousand dollars for them. They applied for the grant. We helped them with some technical assistance on how to do it. Uh, they ran the flavor ran off. I think it was um, I'm trying to remember it was like Frontier or Charter up there. But anyways, they ran in. Um, uh, to the facility. Uh, now they're looking at expanding, looking at building a new facility. They've added two more people to their call center, so now they can do call center stuff 24 hours a day. And uh, the other neat thing is in the video we show, they can uh, diagnose 
uh, problems with their customers' equipment in Asia because now they have uh, you know, symmetrical uh, connectivity. They can upload data at the same speed as gig speeds, and so um, that's a really neat thing for them. And they're out in the Mars Hill, which you don't know is a Batson County, which is way out there. So, uh, so some really, really neat examples of what people are doing with fiber. Just another, I'm going to end right here, but just another quick map to show you. Um, Um, like I said, I'm a little frustrated with the data that's available for mapping. But um, what we try to do is do the best we can with the data that we're getting and then um, and, and then improve upon it. So we'll have, we currently have a place where you can check your availability on our website. We're, gonna, we're currently updating that with our mapping folks. We're looking at a, a uh, online application that's actually a better interface for users for the map, put in your address and we'll show you what infrastructure is available, what the providers are, and so forth. That's available, it's a little clunky all of it now. One of the places we want to get to is where we can use the software uh, that was that was created um, where you can go in and say, hey, that's not right. So hey, that those numbers aren't right, or that map shows that I have service, but we don't have service in this census block. So you can type in your information and uh, take a speed test, uh, and we'll automatically get the data. And that will allow us to manually update this map. So I hope over time, with us promoting the map and this uh, resource, that we'll be able to carve out and be a little bit more specific uh, in, in, in what we have in our maps. Is, this, is that kind of end of that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so one of the things I wanted to show you, though, was uh, expansion. So one of the things we're seeing, though, that's kind of neat, is fiber to the curve uh, coverage. If you look at the blue section, you can see, and I know it's a little uh, washed out in the light. What's that? So if you look at the blue areas here, fiber to the curve, all of those right here um, are uh, telephone co-ops. Here, down here, here. Um, this is great. Uh, this right here in around Guilford County is our state. Um, and so, what what I think is interesting in this as well, Mr. Hershey, what I think is really interesting about this is that if you look, the concentration of fiber to curve that we have currently in the state is in more rural areas because of telephone co ops took the initiative in September 1. And build, build out their networks. The regional companies like North State, which is based in North Carolina, uh, we haven't filled in the ANSI and, and uh, Mitchell yet, but Country Cable is regional, a local, local company. Um, I think that's very, very telling. What it tells me is that the folks whose decisions are being made in Dallas or St. Louis or New York aren't building fiber for the quickly as those who have. The other interesting thing is we are seeing uh, the red shows you where we expanded fiber uh, coverage in 2015. Uh, of course, most of that is in Mecklenburg Wood counties, a little bit in Milford and Forsyth. And then the yellow shows you where they where there was already fiber coverage, but they've increased the speeds. So again, you're seeing some areas down here uh, where some providers are starting to increase up the speeds. Country Cable Vision, when FCC came out with the order to the Threshold went from 10 down to 25 down. That's the definition of broadband. They just tuned up, turned everybody up one one day. So, um, so I think that is a is a neat story. And I think when we're looking at our communities and we're looking at how do we expand fiber infrastructure through the state, if you're not living in a, in, in in Wake, uh, Durham, or uh, Mecklenburg counties, uh, it's probably going to be through somebody local or co-op. We've got to be very creative about who we look at and which providers we bring. The other, the other promising technology I mentioned we're seeing is wireless and fixed wireless are getting better, better, better. And you're seeing a lot of fixed wireless companies pop up and, and provide some really good service. Um, in fact, interestingly enough, in Jackson County, here, we worked with a carpet salesman who was tired of no connectivity or bad connectivity. So he uh, built a tower on top of his carpet store. And put some equipment up 
there and signed up 100 of his neighbors. And now he has, I can't remember what it means, but 25 down now, maybe a little bit faster than that. He's uh, got like 200 people on a waiting list. It's, it's crazy. So he has to Incumbent. Um, I, I'm not sure. It may down there. It may have been charter. I got. I have to go look. There, there wouldn't be. Uh, there's not too many people out there. Uh, Frontier, Drake, Balsam West. Drake is here. Balsam West is here. I don't think Balsam West is in the residential. I don't think so. So it have to be. It'd have to go see Frontier. Is the offering is it free like, or is it uh, subscribers? No, it's subscribers. Yeah, he has subscribers. But it's just interesting that he was willing to make the investment. One of the things that we did with him, we worked with him with the county, was they had a tower, a water tower, that he wanted to put some equipment on. And they usually charge about 4000 not including the engineering fees, to, to have the cellular fire come in and And uh, because he was a local boy and they wanted to help, they waived the fees. So that was, that was a big break. So we were, anytime you get that, uh, help. Uh, the country cable division up here, they were working, they uh, partnered with the um, electric co-op who owned all the telephone poles. The electric co-op gave them a zero fee attachment. To, so they paid for the make ready work, but not the fees on the poles. So that would significantly reduce the uh, capital. So being creative, being proactive, going out and talking to them. Like I said, our technical assistance guys have decades of experience building these things out, know how to talk and talk, so we'll go out and interface a lot of times. It's a lot easier than, and it takes a conversation past that typical conversation that local communities have when they call up and the provider says, yeah, we don't serve that area. Um, or yeah, we serve that area, and then 24 hours, oh no, we don't serve that area, and that ends the conversation. So, so uh, happy to talk to you all afterwards. I'll turn it over to Mark now for his part. So, mine's going to be a little bit different. Uh, so I'm with uh, MCNC, and if I can find my slides, I'll explain. That's not good. So uh, I'm the uh, chief strategist for MCNC. For those of you that don't know us, not-for-profit. Uh, we've been around in the state for quite a long time. We started life as the Microelectronics Center of North Carolina. Uh, that hasn't actually been our name since about 1990, but um, I am used to telling people that. Until we change from initials, I guess we'll get through that for So we were created by the North Carolina General Assembly to help attract the microelectronics industry to research and research uh, Shortly after that got started, uh, and building some network to uh, connect uh, research people at some of the local universities to our center to uh, uh, aid in collaborations. So that quickly grew to uh, supporting medical schools. So we ran video conferencing for uh, statewide grand rounds for medical schools for a long time uh, on a private microwave network that we own. Um, <coughs> Sold 
that company for the CC sold at $750 million to the largest exit like that in North Carolina history. Um, uh, that was like months before the uh, internet market crashed. And, uh, but uh, MCNC invested itself in that stock right away. So the, the end result after the dust cleared and the people who directly did the invention um, got their share. And, People, everybody in the world who tried to sue for pieces of that money um, got finished. It's really left with a bit of an endowment uh, associated with that, which is uh, very unusual for uh, a nonprofit to have for a uh, modest endowment uh, to capitalize the network. Um, we, uh, we have always had a bit of an economic development mission uh, starting with the original creation. Um, Day. So the uh, mission is all about uh, building uh, communications facilities in support of research and education and the economic development now. Um, we also uh, support healthcare under that same umbrella. We said you run the North Carolina Telehealth Network. Um, this is kind of an iron chart, so I'll stick on that. So this is a bit of a history um, look at MCNC, some of the things. Uh, so it's a combination of the internet in general and MCNC. So uh, a few interesting tidbits. Uh, the very first internet domain was registered in uh, uh, 1985. MCNC.org was the sixth .org domain registered, period. So we've been kind of in this internet business for a little while. Um, we were also involved with, uh, on, on here, we had a, uh, NSF grant to do gigabit networking between our facility and uh, UNC Medical School in 1990. It was one of the first uh, applications for gigabit networking where the medical school was connected to the supercomputing center so they could do the near real time uh, analysis of uh, radiation uh, targeting for cancer treatment. Uh, so that was back in 1990. So I had a bit of experience in sort of the development of the internet and This is the 
footprinting resulted from the VTOP um, grant. So part of the mission of that program at the federal level was to uh, uh, promote better broadband, especially middle mile, which is not to the residents, but to uh, uh, include sort of direct service to anchor institutions. <coughs>
how we stack up with some of the others. So uh, the uh, scenic, the one at the top is California. California's population is five times ours. Uh, they're quite a bit bigger. They do not own as much fiber as we do. Uh, they were able to buy some fiber for their network, but they have very limited number of strands. So they have no ability to build a market there. Um, in Florida, it's very much the same situation. Uh, they were able to buy fiber from a service provider to connect the universities, but they have little ability to expand that. Um, uh, Merit, uh, Merritt, uh, which is in Michigan, is uh, the most similar network to ours in the country. Uh, they are actually older than MCNC. They were created in the late 60s. Um, they also ran the National Science Foundation back before we became the university uh, that we know today. They received almost exactly the same amount of uh, VTOP funding as MCNC, but they got their outside match money by selling strands to the providers on the front end. They have very little left to sell now. We didn't do that. We got our private money from other sources and we just um, market on our own. So that's, uh, that's a big distinction in the way those networks are set up. But otherwise, we're quite similar in terms of the size of the organization and our emissions and our, uh, and our longevity. Um, the um, LEARN, which is the one in Texas, is, uh, as you can see, our annual budget quite a bit smaller. We're about uh, Dollars, give or take, and they're about seven and only have a handful of people. Uh, they serve uh, only a handful of universities in the state of Texas. Um, so it just gives you an idea that there's a kind of a wide range of what happens in each state, and we are um, really blessed with a lot more resources than most. And, um, and we have that endowment I mentioned before to back us up to. We use that to uh, fund work we do on future technology and um, to help the refresh of equipment in the network over time so that uh, there's less cost to our, our end users. Um, so this is a little bit about how users on our network get out of the state. So um, it's, uh, there are a lot of errors there. All those represent different connections to external service providers. So uh, we're super highly redundant uh, in terms of that. Um, every one of those errors so we have about half a terabit of external access from our network um, leaving the state in the location. So when I mentioned that small ISPs need backhaul, really the situation in the state is all the national scale providers leave the state in Raleigh and Charlotte. There are no other exits to the state. So if you really want to get the lowest cost and highest performance access, you've got to make it to either Raleigh or Charlotte. Otherwise, you're just being back on the system. Yeah. We augment all those connections with the content distribution networks. So we have Netflix, for example, um, pushes their movies as close to you as they can before they serve them to you. So we have uh, stacks of servers in uh, Raleigh and Charlotte. They push the movies there. But if you're, you go to the nearest one of those uh, server collections, Downloading Netflix, you don't go back to their home, wherever that is, you go to the closest place. So, in North Carolina, those are probably Charlotte, Mr. Salem. For us, Google does the same thing. So, you go to YouTube, you're not going back to you, a Google data center. Most of the time, you're going to one of these uh, content distribution nodes. We have those on the network. We also have private connections to Google in addition to the upstream. private connections to Google to provide that in the state now. So that's, uh, and, and it's all, every provider we have, we have at least two connections to. So that we can lose all of Raleigh, for example, and um, for the most part, you can see no service degradation at all. Um, and that that's a sort of our model is to maintain that uh, diversity that no one can out of take us all out. In fact, <laughs> so, but when this is an issue.
do for small ISPs if they, if they're trying to serve, and they've got to get to the rest of the world, and that means they've got to get the service back to the uh, It's because of all the national scale providers built their networks on what's called the NFL cities model. They kind of touch the, the big cities around the country with that, and, uh, and everything homes sort of that way. Um, makes sense at a national scale, but it makes it tough for a small world service provider. Um, okay. So quickly, this is a mapping exercise that we did with the IT. Um, one of the transition, one of the things that's coming for you guys is a transition from uh, uh, TDM voice service to VoIP. Uh, and all those blue dots represent uh, customers of the state's uh, uh, voice service plan. So you may not buy it directly from the state, but you buy it off the state contract. All those are TDM customers, so we start looking at how do we get better broadband to all those uh, municipalities that are buying off that contract so that they can be ready for that. Uh, so we did this mapping exercise with the IT, trying to get our arms around it, and mostly turned out to be terrifying to see there are any dots. Picture sure and lots of them are not very close to the network. So the, there's some plus, the yellow plus, and the yellow dots are sort of within a mile of our existing fiber, so maybe low-hanging fruit for improving service, but uh, we have big chunks of the state and we have more work to be left in here. We don't uh, have much, and there are lots of uh, TV and customers, so uh, this is something for you guys and municipalities to think about um, coming. This is going to take a big fall for to, to make that to uh, If the state got concerned that the service providers are not